Hi, it's Professor Chu. We're up to week nine of our course on criminals and saints. And uh, for this week, we are studying the Persian Wars by looking at two of our main uh, primary texts about it. One is Herodotus's history. So we're reading uh, a lot more of that. And it's kind of a long reading assignment. So if you can only get through some of it, um, that is OK. Um, you can finish it up for next week. And um, we're also reading a tragedy by Aeschylus uh, called The Persians. Now, um, in the interest of trying to make these videos a reasonable time, and because I know I'm not, you know, the most interesting person to uh, listen to, um, um, I, I'm going to try something a little bit different with this video. So uh, I'm going to try to keep it half an hour. We'll see if that actually happens. Um, but what I have done is uh, you will have this. Uh, well, it's actually a uh, keynote because I don't use PowerPoint. I have a Mac. Anyways. I, I don't like PowerPoint, um, but I guess this is the same thing. Um, anyways, slides. Now, I don't think it's the most productive thing for me to go through every single slide. So you're going to have this certainly to look at for yourself. Uh, but what I am going to do is give you, if anything, an overview of what the slides say. And um, what I'm thinking is that uh, you can read a lot of the information because a lot of this presentation is um, a lot of facts, actually. Uh, going over all the chronology of the Persian Wars. So, um, here we have a Greek hoplite uh, fighting against the Persian, and notice the different styles of dress. You'll see that time and again, especially this, this Phrygian cap, as it's sometimes called. Phrygia is a reference in some ways to Troy, because it's located around the same region as Troy in uh, northwestern Turkey. And also, the, the Persians notably are wearing trousers or pants. Um, Greek hoplites wear tunics. Um, King Darius, or Darius, um, it's called both. These are, we're reading selections from Herodotus about the Persian Wars. And what I've done here is given you um, the books uh, that we're reading parts of, and also uh, put the names of the main characters, historical figures in red, um, so you can keep track of them. And I really recommend taking a look at this or keeping it out when you're reading the book. Um, um, and we're going to go through these events. Um, this is the, the first part of Herodotus that we read was about King Croesus, and that was really background uh, for setting up um, parts of the Persian Empire that, well, that, uh, well, so that, that is to say it's really a sort of a setup for A, for a kingdom named Lydia that gets conquered by the Persians in Book One. And also uh, for setting up the, the idea of monarchs and their relationships with fate, and also with hubris and pride. I think those are all things that we saw in Croesus. Um, so you can think about how those play into all these characters to Darius, the Persian king. Um, Pias, who is the son of uh, Pisistratus, um, who is exiled from Athens and ends up going over to the Persian side. Miltiades is the great Athenian general at the Battle of Marathon. Xerxes is the son of Darius, uh, Darius, who ascends to the throne after him, and he is really the main figure for the last um, three books of Herodotus, which in some, some people call the tragedy of Xerxes. In some ways, he is a tragic figure. Um, he is the great king, the great monarch, the great noble, who uh, the king of kings, who has a, a very elaborate fall. Um, Artabanus and Mardonius are some of his generals. Leonidas is the king of the Spartans at the Battle of Thermopylae. He falls there. And then Themistocles is the archon of Athens, the political statesman, um, who we'll see in Book 8, who leads the Athenians uh, against the Persians in the Great Battle of Salamis, which is um, not the ending battle of the war, but very decisive. And I wanted to highlight Artemisia of Caria for you. She is a queen of Halicarnassus, which you may remember is where Herodotus is from. Um, so again, these slides, I'm not gonna go over every bullet point, but the first one covers the rise of the Persian Empire, which is important to know. It's also called the Achaemenid Empire. Um, and the Persians, um, the background for the Persians arising is the fall of Nineveh by the Medes and the Babylonians. This is the end of the Assyrian Empire um, in Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq, um, which have been the leading power then. That results in um, a number of kingdoms emerging, including Egypt, the Medes, uh, the Neo-Babylonians, and also Lydia, of course, where Queen Croesus is. And so um, there are and one thing to keep in mind as we're going through this. Um, 
there are, um, let's see. Some of this st story is in Herodotus, and some of it's, you know, as you know, it's told in a different order of him. But uh, book one that we read is about the, actually, we started with Lydia and King Croesus. Croesus loses his empire to the Persians, and the Persians have already absorbed this other people called the Medes. So in other words, the Persians have absorbed some of these other kingdoms that arise in the wake of the fall of the Assyrian Empire. The Persians also conquer Babylon um, by 539 BCE, and then Cyrus dies in 530. Um, we didn't read the end of book one, but you could say that he dies out of an act of hubris, um, assuming you know that he can take the Masagitai. His son Cambyses uh, follows him. Uh, Cambyses, who we, we don't, there's uh, the parts about him are cut out of our edition of Herodotus, but he is crazy. Among other things, he marries his sister, um, and. Um, Anyways, he, he falls, uh, Darius becomes the king that's described in the book, and Darius starts to really increase the Persian Empire, adding Greek islands, etc. till 490 BCE, this is a map, this is the Persian Empire, uh, stretching all the way to what is modern day Afghanistan, uh, area called Bagdiana, um, and really extending into northern Greece and Thrace, and of course covering Egypt, and then again, as you can see here, some of the islands. Um, this is a tile, a painted tiles depicting an immortal, um, another sign of the, the, the vastness, not only this, the size of the Persian Empire, it's great wealth. Uh, this is an immortal. There are 10,000 immortals who are soldiers, specially trained, um, loyal soldiers of the Persian king, and they're called the immortals because when one of them died, they're replaced with another one. So this slide counts the, really the beginning of the Persian Wars, which is when the Greek islands on Ionia, the western coast of Turkey, um, rebel against the Persian king because of the fact when you're a subject to the Persian king, okay, that means the Persians aren't going to attack your city, raise it to the ground, kill all the men, and take uh, the women, children, and elderly people slaves. But it doesn't mean you have to pay tribute to the king. And it's because of the, this, uh, because of tribute that the uh, the Persian king, the Persian kings, uh, became so powerful and rich. So the Greek city of Miletus rebels. It has links to uh, the Athenians because it's an Ionian city. It speaks the same, they speak the same dialect as the Athenians. Um, long story short, um, Greeks come over, try to help out, end up burning, uh, capturing part of Sardis, which is the capital of Lydia, and burning a temple. But ultimately, um, they withdraw. Miletus falls. And the Persians extend their empire. They take over even more islands, which are Greek islands today, Chios, Lesbos, uh, Lesbos, Tenedos. <coughs> and Darius, who's the king at this point, wants to establish Persian control. So he um, he sends over his general, Mardonius, to get uh, to reestablish the Persian control in Thrace and Macedonia. And this is when he's joined by Hippias. Um, and when the Greeks attempt the Battle of Marathon, uh, well, the, not the town, but the Greeks and the Persians fight in the Battle of Marathon. Uh, this is part of this invasion by Mardonius, and to the shock of the Persians, a much smaller for, uh, force of Athenians defeats the great Persian fleet. Um, Marathon is not far uh, from Athens, actually. You go there today, you take a bus, and you pass a monument to it. Um, and um, this diagram gives some idea of the Athenians' ability uh, their attack. What happened in this battle it really showed the strength of the Greek hoplites, the um, Greek army, who all fought in a line with their shields, uh, um, defending um, the man to the left. Um, so, uh, you know, the Persians who had horses and had, you know, this celebrated army uh, were shocked to see the Greek Persians, the Athenian Persians and, and other, uh, other of their allies from other parts of Greece running towards them at full speed. They thought they were crazy. And uh, the result was the Persians retreated and uh, it was quite a disaster for the Persians. Um, Herodotus goes into much more detail about this, um, and you know, talking, for instance, that you know, a sort of there's, there's sort of mythological aspects to Herodotus' description of the Battle of Marathon, including that a hero appears, you know, in the sky, uh, you know, and terrifies, you know, he terrifies anyone who looks at him, and it's a hero of the Athenians, some kind of supernatural figure. So this is the great uh, first defeat of the Persians by the Athenians, um, after which uh, Darius dies. His son, he's succeeded by his son Xerxes, who uh, starts to, again, rebuild, the, you know, rebuild, uh, reconquer um, lost territories of the Persians. He reconquers Egypt. Uh, 
And um, he sets about a campaign to uh, the rest of Greece, having uh, been unsuccessful. So um, again, another uh, base painting, again, showing a Greek hoplite fighting a Persian, again, with the distinctive Persian dress, um, the pants, the bow and arrow, and um, the, uh, the Persian cap, the Phrygian cap, uh, no defense against the Greek hoplites. Again, the hoplites were a citizen army. Many of the Persian empire, many were slaves, but they were also subjects of the Persian king. So um, knowing that the Persians are coming, the Athenians uh, join the Spartans. First of all, that's what's called the Hellenic League. Sparta is actually has a huge population and it's of course it's famous military state that produces the best army. And so the Persians, uh, these Spartans and the Athenians join together. Meanwhile, the Athenians have decided to build a fleet uh, persuaded by the Mystocles. Xerxes famously leads a force across the Hellespont of the Dardanelles to invade Greece, creating a bridge of ships. Herodotus describes it in much detail. And um, the a small force of Spartans, the famous 300 Spartans under their king Leonidas, also with their allies, which include 1,100 Boeotians, try to hold back the Persians um, at Thermopylae on the 18th of August in 480. They are defeated um, in part because of a traitor, um, a Greek who uh, tells the Persians about a secret pass in the mountainside. This is a photograph of Thermopylae as it looks today. Um, this has been, this would have been where the battle was fought. This is the mountain passes. Um, and so as you see, Thermopylae is actually located on the water. Herodotus tells us in book seven that the hoplites were the best in the world. Um, and, you know, when you're reading about the Spartans, I mean, many people understandably, you know, make a lot about this scene. As you know, there's a, a movie about it, 300. It, it certainly sets up the Spartans as the embodiment of, a cer of certain kinds of ideals of bravery, you know, the hoplites, the brave fighters who stand together and fight to the, fight to the death. Um, always to keep in mind about the Spartans is that they had enslaved um, their neighbors in Messini, who were called the Helots, and also um, that this, the Spartans uh, had achieved this military society because they had a very strict agoge, which means their upbringing or training. The Spartans, again, were known for their frugality um, so certainly it's not, uh, you know, it's not a sign of Greek ideals. Um, Spartans, uh, there's a famous scene uh, in book nine after the final decisive battle at Plataea when the Spartans uh, le are the leading force in a combined Greek army, including Athenians who defeat um, Mardonius. Um, the Spartan king, Pausanias, um, you know, goes into the tent of Mardonius. You know, the, the, the Persian general has, has you know, fled away. Um, and, um, and I didn't assign you to read book nine, by the way, but you're welcome to read it. I didn't want to overload you with reading, but um, you're welcome to read it. Um, you know, and he finds all the luxury in Mardonia's tent, all the chefs and the, you know, the cooks and the pastries and the gold and the drools and silk and luxuries and all this stuff. He um, has the uh, Persian chefs cook, um, you know, an elaborate meal that they would for the Persian king and then he refuses it. Um, saying that he's only going to eat, you know, the bare, plain, simple Spartan food. So, you know, it's, it's a sign of how the Greeks are defining, are seen as defining themselves um, with this sort of frugality, poverty, but also, you know, drawing strength uh, from it against the luxuries of the Persian and also the size of the Persian Empire, of course. This is just another map of um, Thermopylae that I took when I took students uh, to Greece um, a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a monument there now. Uh, this is modern. This is Greek molo labe, which means in going cake. Um, and then other memories of Sparta. And again, you have these slides to look at. Uh, so this is this famous epithet by the Greek lyric poet Simonides, old saying, Angelain lakadai monios hotiteida, came at the toys canon, re masi pe thamenoi. Stranger, go and tell the Lacedaemonians that here we lie, their words we did obey. So this uh, epitaph is seen as a, um, you know, sort of this embodiment of the, the that, why the Spartans are the best in the world, as Herodotus says. Um, it's supposed to be, uh, it's a monument on the grave of, the, of it's a, an epitaph on a monument that was supposed to be there in the ancient world. Uh, Herodotus quotes this epitaph and says that he saw it. Um, it's supposed to be, of course, the, the, you know, the, the dead Spartans, 300 who died, you know, telling, you know, whoever reads the, the epitaph that they should go back to Sparta and tell the Spartans there that they did as they should do as good Spartans, they died uh, fighting um, to the death. 
Um, and this epitaph, if you're of literary uh, persuasion like me, um, it's inspired many other uh, epitaphs. Um, it uses an elegiac couplet, which has a dactylic examiner and a pentameter. And uh, this is a quote from no one less than a, it's William Butler Yeats, who has a poem called On Ben Bulben, in which he is uh, writing an epitaph for himself in the style of Simonides. So again, another sign of how the Spartans have certainly exerted a lot of, how would you say, admiration. Um, an admiration, you know, with their society of eunomia, the society of a good order. We've looked at Spartan society before, and someone in contrast, of course, uh, to Athenian society. Um, so uh, the other big power at this time, of course, is the Athenians. And we looked at Cleisthenes democratic reorganization of Athenian society before. What I have here is some quotes from Herodotus uh, with his special comments about the Athenians. So he says the Spartan hoplites are the best in the world, but notice what he says about Cleisthenes democratic reforms and his, um, how noble a thing equality before the law was. Equality before the law, of course, is isonomia, that concept that we uh, have been discussing. And uh, as Herodotus says in book five, Cleisthenes, um, so this descendant of the Alcmaeonids, the aristocratic family who got exiled from Athens at one point during the tyrants, Cle Cleisthenes took the demos into his party. Um, that's a reference to how Cleisthenes, you know, ar aristocratic birth really took the people and joined them all together, adjusting the tribes and the deans, these traditional organizations of Athens to neutralize regional interests. And this is this diagram that we looked at in which he combines you know, people from the city, the hills, and the coast into different configurations, um, bringing the larger area of Athens together into a community. Herodotus also says in Book 5 that it's really the fighting Athenians who prove how noble a thing equality for the law was. In other words, equality before the law, isonomia, um, not only results in this uh, democracy, but also in uh, better fighters, better army. Um, after the uh, Battle of uh, Thermopylae, um, this is when the Persians actually keep advancing. So they march onto Athens, the Acropolis falls, the, per the Persians burn and loot uh, the whole city. Um, and Themistocles has convinced the Greek naval commanders to fight at Salamis, where um, in a famous battle, uh, the Greek Navy defeats the Persian army on the 29th of September, and Xerxes returns to Persia. This is a slide about the uh, Battle of Salamis um, for um, and um, this is described by Herodotus um, about how uh, the Persians lost as many as 200 ships. The Greeks only lost about 40. Um, the Greeks very savvily and all the, when the Greeks knew the Persians were coming, they, um, under Themistocles, because of an oracle they'd received from Delphi. Um, the oracle said that if the Athenians hid behind a bulwark of wood or a, a wall of wood, they would be safe. So some Athenians interpreted this to mean, as you'll see, um, that they should build a wall, literally, they were thinking concretely, um, and uh, stay and defend the Acropolis. Um, but Themistocles thought that it meant the, the ships that Athens had uh, been able to fund because it was it was lucky and um, got a, um, had gotten a large store of silver from a mine in uh, Lorium, which is near Athens. So all the men, women, children, the population of Athens went to this island Salamis, which as you may recall from a previous uh, lecture, the Athenians had uh, taken, uh, gotten power over um, um, after fighting with the city of Megara for this. So the Athenians are all in Salamis and this is, uh, the battle happens here. As you can see, it is, you know, uh, the island surrounded by these narrow channels of water and the Greek main force was not very large. Um, um, and um, nonetheless, uh, against the force of uh, the Persian main force and also Egyptian ships, uh, was able to defeat the Persians by sort of luring them into this narrow channel. And uh, so they didn't have any way to get out. And uh, defeating them, all of Xerxes watches on a throne that he had erected above a mountain. Uh, and uh, after this, the Greeks didn't pursue. The Persians actually, they didn't. They don't all, the play that we're going to read, that we are reading, the Persians depicts all the Persians as leaving, but the uh, Persians actually uh, withdraw into the northern part of Greece where they had allies and um, spent the winter there. Um, again, uh, these are some quotes to look at. I, and I, what I've given here are the numbers and roughly the, the place that they are found in Herodotus. Um, you may not find these exact translations. Um, um, I've uh, taken some that... Um, 
uh, from some other texts, but um, if you want the exact translations from our book, I can add them too. Just let me know. But um, you can look at this passage, though. It's in Book 7, in which Xerxes and Artabanus, who was his advisor, um, discuss you know, their plans. Um, and, you know, notice how Herodotus is inserting a certain kind of idea in this, you know, a telling of Xerxes and this sort of tragedy of Xerxes, the autocratic, all-powerful king. Um, he says it is God's way to bring the lofty low. Um, retreat is no longer possible for either of us. We do not inflict the wound, which shall assuredly receive it. So the Persians feel that they have to go forward. Uh, they don't fight against the Greeks now. They'll, they'll be wounded themselves. Um, and um, Xerxes in Herodotus telling exhibits some strange behaviors, you might say, um, in which he really tries to, as we would say today, control nature. He cuts through Mount Athos, saying that it's a mere ostentation. And when uh, he has to build this bridge of boats to cross the Hellespont, um, the Hellespont being um, over here, you can see this small um, bit of water, um, Xerxes the uh, Hellespont by building a huge bridge of boats. Uh, he has, the, at, his, at his command, he has an arsenal of engineers. And uh, so these boats, these sort of pontoon boats are lashed together with ropes. Um, a storm comes and destroys um, their first bridge. And uh, Xerxes um, has the, uh, the Hellespont whipped. He actually has some of his men go in with whips and uh, whip the water and also uh, put chains on it throwing chains into the water um, seems very strange behavior. But in, in Herodotus' is telling, I think it's also a sign of how Xerxes, the king with the absolute power, can do whatever he wants. That's how he sees himself. He even can control nature. When nature doesn't do what he wants it to do, he will punish it as he punishes it as he would punish any of his other subjects, as he does. Uh, in this story in uh, book seven, when uh, one of his guest friend uh, has, you know, all of the guest friend's sons are all fighting in, in the Persian army, and he asks that one son not have to do that. Xerxes takes the son, cuts him in two, uh, and then marches the army between the two halves of the guest friend's son. Power of the Persian king. It's all defeated at the Battle of Salamis, and then also at the Battle of Plataea decisively. Um, so after Salamis, Xerxes retreats to Persia, um, and the Battle of Plataea is where um, 5,000 Spartans, 5,000 Perioikoi, those who live around the Spartans, 35,000 Helots, I cannot forget them, and 8,000 Athenians defeat the Persian army. Uh, notice that the Athenians actually are offered um, an alliance by the Persians, the restoration of Attica and the city's rooms, the cities including Thebes, had gone over to the Persians. So again, not every city in ancient Greece is a democracy. Thebes is a sign of an oligarchical government, um, which had allied with the Persians. But uh, the Athenians instead proclaimed their shared heritage with Greeks and refused to do that. Um, after the Persian Wars, the Spartans retreat home and continue uh, to uh, in their habits, shall we say, and customs. Uh, whereas the Athenians actually start a new phase of uh, classical Greek history when they continue to sail north and um, take some of the islands, Samos and Lesbos, which you may remember was uh, an island that the Persians had taken over and uh, bring them into an alliance and also liberate the Greek cities on the Hellespont. So in other words, uh, the Athenians start to see themselves as, as unifying, as a uh, as joined with other Greeks uh, against this common enemy of the Persians. And um, this map, which you can explore at your leisure, describes basically the sort of two phases of the Persian invasion. The orange line on the bottom is the, uh, in 490, um, the conquest by Darius's uh, generals, Mardonius, um, ending up at the Battle of Marathon. And the purple line shows the, uh, the expedition of Xerxes, so again, over the Hellespont, um, and then uh, going uh, down through the cities of Macedonia and Thrace um, into uh, central Greece. Now, one thing to keep in mind about this map is that, as it says here, these red cities are those or that they were Persian victories. So we see Miletus is here, for instance, uh, Chios, um, other places that the, these are Greek cities, Ionian cities, Greek speaking cities that the Persians had conquered and brought into their empire. Um, the blue cities are the allies of the Athenians. Um, there are some. Uh, notice that Argos and Thebes had allied with the Persians, so those are two states with autocratic governments. Um, and then other cities in the north, including Larissa, 
Um, so what does this say? Well, some uh, in some of these cities, as you know, autocratic governments were in power. And in general, um, in the northern part of Greece, um, there were even in some places like Pella, just the home of Alexander the Great and Philip II, his father, uh, there was a hereditary kingship. And so not surprisingly, perhaps these cities were more inclined to uh, favor the Persian side against the democratic tendencies in the south. Um, the Persian Wars are significant um, because, well, defining Greeks as those with a common language and with common blood, religion, and also customs. Um, Herodotus um, was actually a subject of the Persian Empire. He, again, is from, let's skip around, Halicarnassus, uh, or Crete, Artemisia, Artemisia um, ruled um, during the time of the Persian Wars. Uh, so he was uh, not, uh, he was Greek speaking, but he was not from mainland Greece. And, uh, but Herodotus seems to have had a fascination uh, with the Athenians and Spartans or an admiration for them. Um, he spoke no other language besides Greek. That was his main language. And um, what you can really see him doing here is writing this objective and impartial account of the past, looking at different sources, weighing different stories. Whereas before this, when a, a history was written, as for instance in Egypt, the king was really the source and the owner of the past and would uh, dictate how it should be told. Herodotus, you know, we don't know a lot about Herodotus, but you know, he didn't have any ties to governments or you know, to, um, to the court or the state of um, any cities, just as far as we know. So he was writing this history, um, again, um, for his own, um, because of his own purposes. <coughs> and um, another thing to keep in mind in looking to Herodotus comes out more clearly, clearly, I think, in the um, again with that scene about the Spartans uh, getting the tent, finding the tent of luxuries of Mardonius after uh, the Battle of Plataea. The simple life of the Greeks and their cooperative political arrangements and the belief in liberty and freedom, which Herodotus mentions, are contrasted with the huge Persian Empire, its pride and its luxury. Notably, only about 30 to 40 of the 700 Greek cities around the Aegean uh, resist resisted the Persians, so the Athenians and Spartans were exemplary. Now what's going to happen after this? In the same century, from 431 to 404, is the Athenians and the Spartans will go to war against each other in the Peloponnesian War. And um, this is because Athens starts to take on the look of an empire itself. Athens, the democratic state, starts to act very autocratically, shall we say, very tyrannically even, against its allies. Um, um, ending with a quote, though, from Autobanus, again, the Persian, how wrong is it to teach the heart always to seek for more than it possesses? How wrong is it to teach the heart to uh, want more than it already has? Um, you can apply that to the Persians. You can apply that to King Croesus. You could apply it to the Athenians. But that's um, coming a bit later in our class. I added another slide here. Uh, just uh, because the events that we just went through about the Persian War, they may not seem that connected to uh, Book One, which we did read a bit of. So I just provide you with an outline here of Herodotus Book One because it does it does set up some things in the whole histories. Um, the idea about what was great being being small now, what was small being great, um, and it begins uh, with the section about Helen of uh, the, the abduction of Helen of Troy, uh, actually with myth that Herodotus looks at rationally. In other words, you're talking though really about a war between Europe or the, the Greek West and Asia, in particular talking about uh, the deaths of women. Um, is when book one launches into the history of Lydia. Um, that's when we get the stories about Candales and Gyges. Uh, you may recall Candales is the king who brags about how beautiful his wife is and insists that Gyges, his most beloved courtier, see her naked. Uh, Gyges does this, the queen sees him, the queen tells him the next day, you have two choices, you can marry me after killing the king, or you can get killed right here, he chooses life. Um, Gyges, as it turns out, is an ancestor of Croesus, and um, this is a comment really about the idea of fate in Herodotus, but um, Gyges comes to the throne, in other words, for an illeg illegitimate reason, even though he is forced to do it, um, and um, this... Uh, Misfortune, or this, this, uh, you know, this, this, this sin that he has committed uh, is is finally played out in the fall of Croesus, his uh, descendant. 
when Croesus falls to uh, Cyrus, the Persian king. Um, so, and the rest of book one is about Cyrus, the history mentioned earlier in these slides. Um, and then uh, also details, um, starts, um, starts by going into the ethnography of Egypt, including how to determine the oldest language in the world. That's actually in book two, but I wanted to mention that just because Herodotus is not only known for his account of the Persian Wars, but for his accounts of other ancient, of other societies, his awareness that there are other places where they do things differently. And that's, it's not, it's not, it might be considered strange, but it's something to know about. It's not something to hide from. Um, the Persian Wars had a lasting effect on the Greek imagination, and uh, that's why we're reading Aeschylus' play called The Persians, um, for, which was produced in 472 BCE. Um, just a little bit about ancient Greek tragedy. All Greek tragedies were performed in a great festival called the Greater or the City Dionysia. Dionysius is the god of tragedy. He's also the god of wine. And uh, as, um, tragedies were always performed in a competition. I mean, it's sort of like... We have the Oscars, but everyone would, be, would actually be, you know, presenting their plays in, you know, the two weeks or whatever before the, the, were, the Oscars were awarded, and uh, they'd be uh, judged. So I guess maybe it's more like American Idol, like that. Um, you competed by uh, writing um, a trilogy, and so uh, the other plays in the Persons trilogy are called the Phineas, which is about um, a king. Um, who uh, is beset by the harpies, these mythical creatures, uh, women's heads and birds' bodies, and another play called about Glaucos of Pontia, who is a king who has these magic horses that end up eating him. We don't have those two plays. That's all we know about them, the stories. And then there's a satyr play uh, called Prometheus Perkatos. A satyr play is not, a, is uh, after seeing these three heavy tragedies about suffering and fate. Uh, the Greeks uh, would perform the satyr play, which would be a basically a comedy um, in which, in this case, you have a mythological subject, Prometheus, uh, who we know stole fire. Well, this is a play about Prometheus stealing fire, but from a satirical, humorous uh, view, you know, Prometheus has the fire and the satyrs see it and these, Prometheus says, don't hold that too close to your face, you'll burn your beard. Um, ancient humor. Um, this is a Greek theater. Uh, this is the theater of Dionysius, which is actually in Athens. Uh, so this is called the orchestra, this round area. It's a dancing floor, um, not where the music is played. And the chorus sings and dance here. The chorus marches in on the two sides. Um, and uh, the theatron is where the audience sits. And the skene is uh, really just a simple wooden stage. Um, in Aeschylus' time in the Persians, the Persians is really Aeschylus' oldest play. So the oldest play that we have complete or extant. And um, the Persons you'll see is a rather, it's, it's not the easiest play to read, or you could say it is the easiest, it is not a difficult play to read compared to some later Greek tragedies if you read others. Um, Aeschylus is of interest, he fought at the Battle of Marathon, apparently his brother died there. And um, this, this play is also of interest because it is really our only surviving Greek tragedy that is about a historical event. Um, the Athenians did not seem to like plays about historical events or how we're picky about it. Um, Phrynichus, who is a um, predecessor of Aeschylus, wrote a play in, produced in 492 BC before the Battle of Marathon called The Capture of Miletus about the same event uh, that we discussed earlier that led to the Persian Wars. Uh, this made the Athenians so upset. They burst into tears and whoa, whoa. Um, he was fined a thousand drachmas um, and the, was forbidden to perform the play again. So he tries again uh, with another play in 477 BCE, which is really about the Battle of Salamis, um, called the Phoenician Woman. Phoenicia would be where modern-day Lebanon is, so it's about women who um, are seeking uh, news about their um, lost uh, husbands um, and uh, relatives in the Battle of Salamis, because Phoenicia is a, a, a subject of the uh, Persian Empire. Um, but um, one way to think about the play, um, which if you find it confusing to read, is that it's basically about a community hears really bad news and it weeps. Um, to help you read this play, um, or to understand it, um, what I have done is a little bit different. So I'm not going to go into excruciating detail about it because but it is a play. Therefore, I think it would be more useful for you to do this. Um, what I put up on uh, Sakai is a short video summary um, about, um, um, let's see, this is actually week eight. 
Um, about the Persians, it gives you a summary of the whole play with this sort of simple cartoon. It's from the Open University in the UK. And um, if you feel confused about what's going on in the play, I'd watch this first. It's simple, um, you know, uh, but I, I think it conveys visually things that um, are more boring to hear me or less, um, may not stay in your mind as much um, if I talk. So please take a look at that. And if you are curious, you don't need to watch this other video, um, but it is about modern production of the Persians. And um, it has um, some uh, classics professors in uh, England speaking um, who are experts on tragedy. Um, it has some shots from a famous production of the Persians involving a lot of dancing. And, um, and you, this is the chorus dancing here um, um, from um, the 1960s, I believe from Greece. And also a, a Peter Sellers pr production. He's an avant-garde um, theater director, um, which depicts a very different play. But um, this is a play. It's important to think about it being performed. And so I encourage you to watch those. The first one is about two and a half minutes. The second is about eight and a half. Um, and um, this play is, what do you think about this play? It is, again, an unusual Greek tragedy. It only has two actors in it. Um, it has... Um, it has, it has a very limited cast of characters. Uh, basically it includes Atassa, who is the wife of the widow of King Darius. Um, and get to my presentation here. Um, it features Dari uh, Atassa, the widow of King Darius. Um, and Darius himself shows up as a ghost, a messenger, and uh, Xerxes arrives at the very, very end. So uh, since there's only two actors, uh, Atossa is played by one actor, keeping in mind, of course, that all Greek actors at this point performed one in mass, in elaborate costumes, and two, they were all men, so Atossa is played by a man. And uh, Darius's ghost shows up, and then uh, the last thing that happens is Xerxes shows up in rags after the defeat uh, of Salamis. So the same actor would have played both Darius and Xerxes, um, the play starts uh, also with the chorus on stage, um, wondering, it's, it, it's set in uh, Persia, and uh, the chorus is wondering what happened uh, at the Battle of Salamis. A messenger comes and tells them about the terrible loss at um, Salamis, and Atasa mourns. She summons the ghost of Darius, asking, what can we do? Darius uh, arise, you know, rises, I kind of figured it was, you know, the, the scene of, you know, with Hamlet's ghost. And uh, not only does he tell her more about the disaster that happened, but he also says that there will be another a disastrous battle. It turns out to be the Battle of Plataea he's describing. And um, what he describes is that uh, the reason that the Persians uh, lost in this telling of Aeschylus is uh, that the Persians uh, had no shame to strip. So this is from around, This is these are the Greek uh, line numbers. Um, this is, and this is my translation of some of these lines. So it's different from what you have in your text, um, but I tried to make it a little more literal. Had no shame to strip the gods, the oh, statues to burn temples, make nothing of altars and holy presence or shrines of daimones, that's another word for our God, uh, up their foundations to uproot. So acting impiously, the Persians yet suffer. So Darius says, you know, well, the reason the Persians have lost in this terrible, humiliating way is because they were not, they did not, um, they showed hubris as it were. They did not, uh, ex they were not humble before the gods, the Greek gods, um, when they uh, invaded Hellas. And at the very end of his speech, he says, for pride, you, that's the translation of the word hubris here, will blossom. It's born the fruit of infatuation or ate, um, reaped a harvest of infinite tears. Um, these two words are important to note in the play and think about them as you're reading this idea of a pride. Um, so that's uh, suggested suggested in Herodotus too, in terms of a lot of the autocratic tyrants, um, Croesus, Cyrus even, um, and uh, um, Xerxes. Um, and um, there's this other notion of ate. And I have listed here on another slide um, these Greek terms, uh, giving you some little definitions for them. I mean, these are some things to keep in mind when you're, again, reading the play, and uh, we'll get to write about them. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, a uh, late classicist, uh, one of my professors when I was in grad school, really lovely man with a wonderful understanding of Greek tragedy and drama and lyric poetry, C.J. Harrington, um, you know, describes the persons as, you know, 
the way to understand it is to understand it's the play is about understanding the human through the eternal and the divine. Um, so um, and that's sort of a theme you see even in other of Aeschylus's plays. Aeschylus seems to have um, he seems to have been very much a democrat in Athens, but he has a real reverence, shall we say, for the eternal and the divine. Um, so um, if you think of the structure of the play, um, all is confusion in the Persian court um, with Atossa after hearing about the defeat of Xerxes. That's why she sums up Darius. Um, and uh, he provides sort of the answer. He explains uh, why the Persians are suffering. The Persian kings in the play are called Basileus and also despota despoto. Now that literally means uh, the despot of despots um, or despot in the sense of, you know, the master of masters. Um, keeping in mind that Persian kings are considered gods. Um, and Darius says he's a ghost in the play is godly. So he, and Darius also, as you see from Herodotus, he's a king that though his army is defeated in Marathon, he doesn't seem to um, have the excesses of hubris that Xerxes is suggested to do, both in Aeschylus' play and Herodotus. Um, some other uh, words that come up in the Persians that would be helpful to keep in mind are koros. This is abundant or excess, excessive wealth or success. That again, that theme of the Persians and their luxury. Um, even the size of the Persian empire, again, the idea of hubris, arrogance or insolence associated with wrongdoers or even just an attitude of having arrogance or insolence, you know, acting like you can, you know, you're, you're, when you're overconfident, when you feel like you can do anything and no one's going to stop you. That's Xerxes. Um, and then decay, of course, is an idea that we've looked at before. The word actually doesn't occur in the Persians, but um, it is operative in the sense that the play seems to be the defeat of Xerxes is seen as the risk, the restoring of decay of the right order of things, it's just that the Persians lose. Um, and then finally, uh, this other word, ate, which uh, means madness or delusion leading human beings to what can be self inflicted ruin. So it's, it's sometimes it's also translated as infatuation. It's sort of, you know, when you're engaging in hubris, you don't even realize what you're doing is really, really self destructive. You can apply that in any way you will. Um, um, but um, these are also some ideas, koros, hubris, ate, and again, decay, to keep in mind, I think, in terms of our previous discussions about tyrants and kings. Um, so keep this in mind as you're reading the play. And also an idea, which um, you have a chance to write about, is how is this play a tragedy? Aren't tragedies supposed to involve terrible things happening? I mean, remember, this is a play about the defeat of the Persians seen by an Athenian audience right after the Athenians have defeated the Persians. How bad can they have felt about you know, the loss, the Xerxes losses. And so there's really two ways that people tend to look at this. You can look at this play. Maybe there's more. It's either um, in possibly a sympathetic portrayal. Indians perhaps maybe showing some kind of, uh, I wouldn't use that, you know, sympathy or, you know, fellow feeling uh, with the defeated empire or maybe seeing Xerxes not as a Persian necessarily, but just as a defeated, as a great man who suffers a terrible defeat. Um, so that's one way you can look at the play, that it's sympathetic. The other way to look at the play is that it's simply celebratory. In other words, the Athenians, one, kicked the Persians uh, out of, well, the Athenians, that is to say, uh, accompanied by the Spartans and other uh, Greeks and their allies, um, kicked the Persians, kept the Persians from taking over mainland Greece. And so this play, no wonder it won, uh, you know, the first prize, weren't the Athenians glad to see their, um, uh, their, um, weren't the Athenians glad to see the Greeks uh, winning over the much larger and, you know, luxurious, rich, powerful Persian force. So I leave you with that. Uh, we will be reading more Greek tragedy. Um, again, this is the last week that we are looking at Herodotus but um, you should, uh, because we have another long paper coming up and uh, you know, if you feel like the Persians and Herodotus raise some questions that you really would like to explore more, please keep that in mind. Uh, this might be a really good paper topic, I think for a long paper. So have a good week. Uh, thanks a lot.